What up, Biscuits? We are on the ropes with Nick and Joe. I am the King Biscuit, sopping up every bit of that box of gravy. Absolutely, Joe. And with me is a man that is never tired, working hard, always penetrating your brain with pure, unadulterated, absolutely boxing knowledge it is nikolai luthar what up nick how you doing what is going on joe how you doing today i'm good I'm good the weather's a little little hot it uh it turned up on us so i will uh perspire above anything above 60 degrees so we're in the 90s around here now and i'm a little uh a little little uncomfortable well the skies are getting dark around me so i think uh you're gonna get a little relief from this heat here in a minute that would be fantastic. I'm ready for this storm. Yeah. Oh man, we had a nice little quiet weekend this weekend. I got the- it is it is refreshing to have a little bit of a of a reprieve from the hustle and bustle of the boxing world. Yeah, I got to thinking this weekend though, because we you know we're watching we're watching a lot of World Cup, right? And yep. uh, like I, I'm a typical American, I only care about soccer once every four years, but I care about it that once every four years. So, I'm watching this thing, and I'm watching, like, Senegal th- today, and I'm realizing, like, how into the players I'm getting, and how into, like, everybody I, I'm, I'm feeling about everything, and I just stopped, and I kind of thought about this, and we had the Cruiserweight, and we had the Super Bantamweight tournaments. We had the Cruiserweight tournament last year, we had the Super Bantamweight tournament coming up that we've been talking about a little bit, we've been getting excited about, and it got, it got me thinking about the whole thing, right? Like, I don't know, I thought David Beckham still played for England. But like watching, <laughs> okay, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I get it. You're absolutely right. So like you know to find out he wasn't was a uh, you know a, a little surprising, and then I'm trying to figure out who like Harry Kane is, right? And I'm like, okay, so now I understand. But it just got me thinking. Like soccer is huge. Like every country has a league, and maybe not every country, but you know a lot of countries have a league. Like all the Europeans, we have a league. Canada, Mexico, Trinidad and Tobago have a league. So they all have leagues, they all have 10, 15, 20 teams, each team has 50 players on it, and there's just a ton of guys out there, and you never know where these guys are going to come from. And boxing is really the same way. You could be watching, you know, your favorite fighters over and over and over again, and all of a sudden somebody comes up and knocks one of those dudes out, and all of a sudden you got to learn who this dude is, because you never heard of him before, and you're trying to play catch-up with this whole thing. But what I liked about the World Cup is they put you in this tournament format, just like the Cruiserweight tournament, where it kind of focuses you down on just, like, a few teams and a few players, and, like, I'm not going to do all the scouting on all the soccer players. I'm not even going to do all the scouting on all the boxers. But having these guys in a tournament lets me know that, you know, these are the best countries to play, and then these are the best players in those countries, and I trust that those countries have scouts that know who the best players are, so now I get to kind of learn in this focused environment. And I just kind of wish... Boxing would do a little bit more of that. You know, when we look at things like the heavyweight division, and we can look at, like, Deontay Wilder versus Anthony Joshua, and we've been kind of blue-balling over this for the last two years to get this fight made. But, like, how much cooler would it be if if, uh, Deontay Wilder's fight against Luis Ortiz last November was, like, a semifinalist, and the Vladimir Klitschko-Anthony Joshua fight was a semifinal? And you'd be able to focus down, if you had, like, an eight-fighter tournament, you'd be able to, like, focus down on who these eight fighters really are and kind of get to know them a little inside and out, a little bit better than you get to now. And maybe, like, for us and for people that listen to us, like, we're all boxing fans, like, we, we know who most of these guys are. But for, like, your casual that's just coming in to watch the World Cup once every four years, you know, it would really help them understand, like, who these guys are. Yeah, and the fact of the matter is... um if if you have a concentration of eight of the top heavyweights in the world, or even like uh, like you were saying, like if you have four really good heavyweights and maybe four of the top prospect he- prospect heavyweights, that it would um, allow a concentration of information to be able to spotlight uh, who the best are, who the best up and coming are all the information to anybody watching and then all I have to do is check out this tournament and anything associated with the tournament and all the information's there and you easily create fans um, I guess the problem with it is that the format and all of that only benefits 
the fans, and that's in the eyes of promoters, management, cable providers, subscriptions, and all that. They feel like they make – they. I'm pretty sure they can make a lot more money um, doing it during the normal system just like the way they have by concentrating each fight per fight, having the drama and the rigmarole around it, and then making the fight – as they go along, as opposed to a tournament to where you're scheduled, whether you have that tournament be a year or a year and a half long, you're going to be scheduled to actually fight where they don't see the money aspect in it. Do you have a suggestion that would help management and promoters to make the money that they do now, but also benefit us, the fans? I just think if you had a tournament like that, you know, and – Let's just think, let's just say Wilder and Joshua ended up in the finals. That's kind of the situation we're in right now. You know, you have a guy like Anthony Joshua who doesn't have really the name recognition in the United States that you probably hope he would. Obviously, worldwide, he's a megastar. You have Deontay Wilder who doesn't have any name recognition whatsoever. But when you watch a tournament-based format like that, you're constantly reminded of who those eight guys in the tournament are. And as the tournament gets deeper, you're constantly reminded of who's won which fights and how that looks in your eyes. So, you know, if you want to liken this to a World Cup tournament where you have a team like Germany, who's one of the best teams in the world, and they go up against a team like maybe Senegal or they lose to Mexico like they did last week, all of a sudden your ears perk up and you're like, wait a second. I know, even as a super casual, I know Germany's really good at soccer yeah. and Mexico just took them down. Crazy. You start getting to hear that more and more, and you can say like, "Oh, I know, I know, Luis Ortiz is a good boxer. I've heard that name. Or I know Vladimir Klitschko, who is a world name still. United States, England, everywhere. Like everybody knows who the Klitschkos are because they were dominant for so long. That if you don't know who Anthony Joshua is, you know he beat Vladimir Klitschko to get into this, you know, to to advance in the tournament." And that's true. And just to strengthen your point, uh, recently um, Anthony Joshua was at the uh, Nuggets. Uh, yeah, the, the Nuggets Rockets. No, no, no. Yes, yes. Golden State, Golden State, <laughs> Houston Rockets playoff game. And the announcer said that he wanted to see a super fight between Deontay Wilder and Anthony Johnson, which is just a total slap in the face to the boxing world. Yeah. But. The, the, the fact is, like, just to strengthen that point and to go off of it, is that this tournament would, a uh, tournament based, something like this, to have it, I mean, it, it could be like a super series, but make it uh, a little more elaborate to where it's there's a title involved. Like, if you have the IBF or the WBA or BO, um, s- sanction and sponsor a tournament and make it, you could do something like a King of the Hill. I, I'm a fan of, the, of a King of the Hill aspect where right now Anthony Joshua has three belts and say the WBA or the WBO would I be whichever one spot uh, wants to sponsor the tournament like if jo- Anthony uh I almost called him Anthony Johnson if Anthony <laughs> Joshua <laughs> wants to continue on his fight and fight other heavyweights if you have an eight heavyweight tournament that would face Anthony the winner of the eight man tournament would face uh Joshua at the end of the tournament, and then you have maybe two or three of the eight be uh, top caliber heavyweights, and then you have four or five or six of them be prospects with real good records and from different countries. And then that that way you, you got each a lot of countries represented. You have exposure for the sport of boxing, and at the end of the at the end of the tournament, when a winner is crowned, you, you get an extra fight out of it against the heavyweight champion of the world with that recognized belt. So, I mean, all it would do is literally all it would do was promote the sport of boxing. Like it would just, it wouldn't even have to be promoted by a promoter. It would just, it would be, it would become big. It would be unprecedented and it would become big and they won't do it. You know, it's funny with that King of the Hill idea. Like I love that idea personally because when you look at that if you had an eight man tournament you have seven matches that you're going to go through uh you're going to have four in the first round you're going to have two in the second round and one in the final round to fight against anthony joshua fight for his belt and i think part of the issue is you have anthony joshua does have three belts at this point and if the ibf sanctions that the wbo won't or whatever but you have seven matches 
where you can always talk about Anthony Joshua because that's the prize at the end of the table that they're looking to go fight against. And it helps that name recognition. Like, you know, and Anthony Joshua is a bigger star, but, like, think about, like, from a welterweight standpoint, if you had Errol Spence at the top of that hill and you had a King of the Hill tournament to get to him, with his growing popularity and his trajectory, if he gets out in the mainstream America, Errol Spence is going to become a name. Exactly. Like like a household name, not like a na- like all of us boxing fans know who Errol Spence is. Even fringe boxing fans know who Errol Spence is. But I'm talking yeah. like the guys you go in and talk to work, you know, go go in and talk to at work, and like all they know about is like football, baseball. They're gonna know who Errol Spence is if they have a King of the Hill tournament where every time they fight on ESPN, it's the winner gets Errol Spence, the winner gets Errol Spence. Yeah, yeah, and just the fact of it, it makes it more uh, prestigious. It, it, it puts some weight. Behind the fact that you're going to the winner of a of a of a tournament of a, of a vicious tournament gets to fight the heavyweight, the IBF or WBO heavyweight champion of of the world, and it seems like these belts don't hold enough weight nowadays because we have silver champions, we have regular and supers, and like you know the belts like. We think we need more belts, but we need like more belts, not uh, WBC having 18 belts in one weight class. Like just meaning like extra belts, like uh, just more associations making belts. Maybe from this conversation would spawn someone to come up with a new belt that would actually sanction a tournament and actually do this King of the Hill, or just do a straight up uh, tournament to have the winner be. The, the, the king of the hill um, and it, it's just it, it seems like it's a good idea and the only people that would benefit from us is the fans and the, and the sport of boxing itself would greatly benefit it would actually it would it would put that that um that nostalgic and that and that um that just, just the word I use the word but the word prestige it would put prestige back in boxing and make those belts mean something you know who is trying to get into boxing right now right who's that Dana White Oh, you know, and for those who don't know, Dana White is the president of UFC, and yes. pretty much built that organization into what it is right now. It, it went from it went from backyard fights literally to to, to a grand stage. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. So he's talking to Anthony Joshua. I don't know where they're at, but he wants to offer Anthony Joshua like five hundred million dollars to sign a multi fight. And you know. I, if Dana White got into boxing and he had the money to sign all these fighters and get everybody in under the same umbrella, he might be the type of guy to be able to start a tournament like that. You know, and that'd be fantastic. And Dana White actually re- recently came out and clarified um, what that offer to to Joshua was, and it was it wasn't to take him away from Eddie Hearn; it was to give Anthony Joshua the exposure in America that he just doesn't have. And again, case in point, like I mentioned earlier being called Anthony Johnson as opposed to his proper name. And you figure a a three belt heavyweight champion of the world uh, would be known by anybody. And I'm not saying just like a casual or a fan that doesn't follow boxing, but anybody that's in sports media that is going to dare comment on boxing would just know who a three belt heavyweight champion is. And you would know his name. So that's what Dana White's purpose is. It's to actually uh, popularize Anthony Joshua in the U.S. and be popularize him and possibly do a tournament. And we're talking, we're, we're using heavyweights as, as a case in point or an example. Um, the fact is that it could be done with any and all weight classes. Hey, all I'm saying is I learned who Harry Kane was. And that gave you this <laughs> gave you the idea of this super tournament of the highest caliber boxers, which just and they're doing it with the super series, but the super series just doesn't hold the weight like it should. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean it's true, and I, it's part of the reason is some of the fighters they get and some of the divisions they do. Like the, they did the super middleweight division, and, and I think the headlines of that were like George Groves and Carl Eubank Jr. And like no disrespect to George Groves. But he's just not big enough to carry a tournament on his own. Like he's just—he's not even a big enough name in boxing to carry that tournament on his own. Yeah, it's just—you um, you need more star power, and you need like uh, 
I don't, I don't want to use the word promotion. You just need like people to be enthusiastic about it. Like you need to have experts. Like you know, that'd be great for Teddy Atlas to get involved. Teddy. In, you know, like hey, we we talk about how much how he how he translates his how he translates boxing to the common man to the layman and how excited he is about it and how he like. I mean, team up Teddy Atlas and Al Bernstein together and make and put them in charge of uh, of a of a heavyweight title super series tournament and i mean that thing that thing would just it would skyrocket it really would yeah yeah no i agree i know i know but i mean like this is all dreaming like these promoters you know the the anticipation of a big fight is what makes them money not even so much a big fight like we we tune in to see anthony joshua play vladimir klitschko okay yeah that was a big fight but now we're going to watch anthony joshua fight joseph parker not because we really care about Anthony Joshua versus Joseph Parker, but because we want to study Anthony Joshua more because of the Deontay Wilder fight. Yes. And if he fights Tyson Fury next, or if he fights Dillian White next, or whoever he fights next, we're just going to watch that because we're sitting over here thinking like, oh, but the next fight's going to be against Josh or against uh, Wilder, you know. And, and and not to you know not to pick on them because I mean they look like they're getting ready to make that fight. Yeah. But, I mean, we see this all the time. You know what I mean? We see this all the time with, uh, I mean, Canelo Triple G. I mean, we talk about these guys nonstop. Why do we talk about them? Because they, they just drug this fight out. I mean, this fight could have happened two, three years ago. The, the first fight, I mean. Could have happened like mm-hmm. two or three years before it's, it, it actually took place. But they just kind of drug it out and drug it out and drug it out. And now you have Triple G looking for money, which we all... Everybody knows like, that's just a popular consensus. Me and you've been talking about that for months and months now, but everybody's kind of starting to wake up, except your your, your Gers that just they, they love Triple. You know, they are what they are. Enjoy yourself, be a Triple Gear, and I can't wait till we retire so you can move on to the next. But it's both of them. It's both sides. Like you have a Gear and you have a um, you know a Saulist that just loves. Uh, so he could do no wrong, but just these two, like you said, have. Have have constipated this division, and you know we just need some X-Lax going. Ah, on. In fact, please. And just the point is, let's just you know we'll get this rematch going in September, and hopefully, as if Triple G like destroys Canelo, then it's over with. But you know what? You know Canelo is going to win. So it's going to set it up for a third one, and then this will be – they'll just fight until they both retire, and then we'll, we'll all be on the edge of our seat watching it every time because we have nothing else. Do you think Canelo's going to beat Triple G? I mean, I want him to. I mean, what in that first fight gave you the impression that he could beat Triple G? I mean, I, I knew. All right, all right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you that if Triple G takes out Canelo – like he he has he would have to do a more impressive fashion than he did in, in the last. We all I, I'm in, I'm in the same camp that you are that I think Triple G won the first fight. It was not a draw. It was clearly a win for Triple G. So Triple G needs to do that again, but better, and then put this all the rest, and then you won't have any more Triple G Canelo stuff. But if Canelo wins, then you're getting a third one, buddy. Yeah, no, nah, probably. You're you're probably right about that. Uh man. And then, Just and saying. And, 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 and you got Billy Joe Saunders talking about fighting James DeGaulle at super middleweight. <laughs> like, he's probably you just know, as tired of this shit as we are. I mean, it's that fight. Uh, I, I, we don't even talk about this long. That fight is a joke. And, and that is ridiculous that BGS wants to fight James Chunky DeGale. Um, first of all, they're in different weight classes. BGS 160. James Chunky is at 168. Chunky about to retire. Like, he looked terrible against Truex, like you stated earlier. And it's just, it, the fight makes no sense. And BJS makes no sense. He, he, I think BJS, if he was a little more star set at this point, like, he, he'd be a problem clogging up this division, just like uh, Triple G and Canelo are. Why are all the middleweights clogging up the division? I, I don't think they all are. I mean, it looks to me like BJS just wants to get out of this division. I mean, super middleweight is so thin on talent right now. I mean, James James Seagal has a belt. I, like, and we love David Benavides. We're David Benavides fans, but I mean, any dude, any other division, if he were, you know, heavier or lighter, and he was in a different division, they, there's no way that guy's got a belt. I mean, 
I hope that if that's BJS's intention to get out of 160, fine, do it. Vacate your belt so somebody else can get it. Just go fight. That that fight's supposed to be the the, the chunky him and chunky are supposed to fight September. Like they're supposed to fight immediately. And if that happens, fine. Uh, take hold of your 168 belt and vacate 160 and let somebody else pick up that belt. You saw Martin Murray uh, <laughs> called out, called I, out I, mentioned, I mentioned the word belt and you want to talk about Martin Murray right after that? Come on. Well, it's, uh, about what he said about uh, BJS. Oh, what he said about yeah. him? Oh, what oh I don't said, want to talk about Martin said? Murray. Oh, okay, good. I, 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 <laughs> so I didn't get to see the Martin Murray fight, but you gave me your synopsis of it earlier, and I'm like, ah, well, maybe I just just won't watch that fight. They ain't even know, they ain't even know to even repeat that synopsis, so <laughs> don't we all got we all got to <laughs> no, repeat not. it. You know, it's 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 good. It's over. No, but he said, yep. you know, he said BJS dropped out of that fight just so he could he was hoping to get a crack at Triple G. Absolutely. I mean, probably. Why else would he? He 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 postponed the fight. We talked about this. Uh, I don't know if it was the last or, or, or two episodes ago about how the timing of his injuries were perfect, and nobody. And I'm not going to sit here and and accuse BJS of falsifying an injury to get out of a fight. But the timing of the first injury was right around when uh, Planello um, got called for drugs, and he wanted to step in against Triple G. And the second one was when, you know, right right before, right after uh, Triple G fought, so he, he can get Canelo for September 15th. So, I mean, it just seems the timing of both injuries were perfect, that he could have either fought Triple G or Canelo. He could have fought – first injury, he could have fought Triple G on May 5th, and the second injury, he could have fought uh, Saul on uh, Mexican Independence Day, September 16th. So – that's all I'm saying. So Martin Mar- Mar- Mary could be right about that. You know, and there's so many, like, good things. I mean, first, I mean, I agree with you. Like, look, these guys are probably injured all the time, so they probably always could cry injury and, and get out of a fight if they really wanted to. I mean, they're probably just constantly dealing with something. But, you know, if BJS does go up to super middle and, you know, he wants to fight Chunky, What's really cool about that is, like, that WBO belt, I mean, if you look at their rankings, I mean, you could get a Demetrius Andre versus Daniel Jacobs for the vacant WBO belt. How, how would you it. feel about that? I mean, I mean that would be exciting, go. right? That, their styles would, would play so perfect. Styles make fights, and Boo Boo versus Danny Jacobs would be an absolute bomb of a fight. It, it would just be, like, fireworks. It would just It would be perfect. It would be a perfect fight. I'm excited. Perfect fight. I'm excited for it. You know what else is perfect? What's that? We forgot to announce. This is the oh, this is the very last episode of On the Ropes podcast. What? What? Yeah. <laughs> the next episode what? you hear will be absolutely boxing's podcast. Crazy, and I will be recording that episode from the sunny state of Florida. <sighs> I, I mean, I ought to go with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Oh, it's going to be so hot here next weekend. It is going to be so hot down there next weekend, so I don't think it matters. Well, I can't actually head down to Florida this weekend because i got to work this weekend, don't I? You do. That's right. Yeah. Nick of uh, On the Ropes Podcast, formerly, or formerly On the Ropes Podcast, will be absolutely boxing, is going to be working the press box at Excite Fight Night 2 at Parks Casino I am. in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Come on out. Support them. Let's go. Yeah, I'll be there. If you guys see me, feel free to stop by. Say hi. I'm excited. I like talking to people. I like talking to boxing fans. I'll argue with you for a while. Uh, come up and tell me how much you love Triple G. We'll fight all night. <laughs> yeah, just look for, the most, look for the most handsome man in the press row, and that will be Nick Fish. Watch David Lemieux be there, and everybody keep asking him if he's me. <laughs> I think David Beckham's going to be there and they're going to be asking him to you I about think that. David Beckham's a little busy right now watching England tear up the World Cup I mean he ain't playing he ain't playing but you know you know he's there I saw I was watching Columbia today I saw Carlos Valderrama was there that was a little throwback to when I was a kid oh. and I saw uh, uh, I saw Maradona in the crowd for uh, for when, when Argentina was playing Okay. Yeah, I, was, I was excited. Yeah, I love seeing Maradona. He's fun. 
Hey, you enjoy. Hey, I mean, I know a little soccer. I don't know much, but I know Maradona. I, I know none. You mentioned those names, and I, I'm Beckham. Oh, you remember Carlos Valderrama? He had the big blonde. He was the Colombian dude. He had the big blonde fro. That's the one that was on a '70s show. Uh, Hyde. No, the um. Cheech and Chong. No, the guy that was on the '70s show. Another his name. No, that's 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 and that's Wilson. Uh, what the, what was his name? I know you're talking about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Wilmer, Wilmer Valderrama. Oh, see, I was. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fez. Yeah. All right. All right, we're done. Hey, did you uh did you catch the trailer for Creed? Absolutely, and I can't wait to see it. Um. It's Rocky movies. I mean, like like we, we talked about before, Rocky is probably one of the best uh, boxing movie series that you're probably ever going to see. Just from the story, the underdog story, uh, just the whole thing. And any time a Rocky movie's on, even the the quote unquote bad one of Rocky Five, any any time they're on, I'll watch bits and pieces of the whole thing. Creed One is a part of that, and I'm sure it looks like Creed Two will also become a part of that. I love the storyline of Drago's son and Adonis Creed avenging his father's death. And I'm in. I, I wish the trailer would have showed me more above Drago, except one clip of the back of his uh, ring gear. But otherwise, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, I am, like, not in love with the Drago's son storyline. That just sounds I, so why? hokey to me. Why? why? I have no idea. Why? Right. It's like Rocky, Rocky Four is, like... People's like favorite Rocky of all time. I mean, Rocky Four is people that don't like movies. Favorite Rocky of all time. Because Rocky uh, One see, is so good. Look, I love Rocky uh, one, Four. Don't get me wrong. I love Rocky Four. One through four, my uh, three is actually my favorite. I love Clubber Lang. I, I just uh, I three is my favorite. All right, all right, that's fine. That's fine. Look, I love one through four. Look, one through four are all interchangeable to me, but three is at the top because I love the Clubber Lang. I love Mr. T. I love how he talks. I love his attitude. Mr. T's a killer. That's what he was. Killer. Everything after one to me was just kind of like, I, and, and excluding Creed, because I think I think Creed kind of brought this back a little bit. But everything after one was kind of like, I don't know. It was just it, like it was goofy in a good way. Like I'm not I'm not I'm not here knocking the Rocky movies. I'm you know boxing fan from Philly. Like, there's no there's like no it, way it, I'm knocking the Rocky sound, movies. It sounds. Like but like come on, Rocky Four was like, oh, this is how we beat communism, you know. Whereas Rocky One was like a human story, you know. It was just it was a guy, you know, who just got his chance, and he, you know, chuck up there, you know what I mean? But I'll fight the big fight. I'll fight the big yeah, fight. I'll fight the big fight. But <laughs> as much as much as I kind of like, I, I don't know, man. It's like I, I've seen the Drago story. I know the Drago story. You trying to pitch me Drago's son is kind of like uh, you just want money. I love but it's a Rocky movie. It's going to be good. Creed one was amazing. I love it. Yeah, this will be fine. I want to see. I can't wait to see Drago's son get whooped up by Adonis Creed. I know. I know. I you know, it'll be good. It's a Rocky movie. It's gonna be. It's gonna be good. It's, it, it's a. It's a Rocky movie that's not Rocky five. It's gonna be good. <sighs> Man, it'll be fine. Hey, uh, so on that topic, what is the best boxing movie of all time? Is it Rocky three for you? Uh. That's a tough question. Oh man, <laughs> I just like I just hit that with it too, man. <laughs> you did. Um, I, it's no because <laughs> Rocky Three is my favorite, but I have to be in agreement with you to say that Rocky One is the best Rocky. I don't know. No, no, the best boxing <laughs> movie. I mean, like, look, it, you got you got three to come right to mind, right? You got Raging Bull, Rocky, the Fighter, right? Uh-huh. And I'm a little partial, you know, Raging Bull and The Fighter are both based on true stories. I'm a little partial to those. Um, right. And then you have some Dark Horse contenders out there. You got you got Hurricane, you got Ali, you got Creed, which is a Dark Horse. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, as far as, like, anything I would actually put in, like, serious contention. You know, I just, I mean, you know, I, I watched, I get yeah, it. I watched Hands of Stone. That was fine. And, you know, again, it was based on true stories, based on Duran, so I like that. Uh, I watched what was the Vi- the, the Vinny Paziani uh, movie? Um, bleed. I, I bleed. I bleed for this or bleed, bleed for, for this. this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. With uh, Miles Teller in it. I love Miles Teller. You know, so I was I was a fan of that. 
I know that was based on a true story, but definitely had some creative liberties, and it wasn't totally true. I get it, but I did like that movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was cool. It was a fun movie to watch. It had creative liberties, like a lot of creative liberties. I get it. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with The Fighter. You like The Fighter? I'm a Christian Bale fan. Okay. Christian Bale was, was, was absolutely, he was phenomenal in that movie. Yeah, he dropped all that weight to, to really look like Dickie Anglin and, uh, he was a crack. He, he, I think he actually smoked crack to do that movie. <laughs> it's possible. It looked like he smoked crack to do that movie. Plus, the fighter's got like one of my favorite knockouts of all time in it. The Mickey Ward versus Alfonso Sanchez <laughs> knockout. Oh my god, I love that knockout. <laughs> if you've only seen the movie or you haven't seen the movie and you've never even seen Mickey Ward versus Alfonso Sanchez, just go ahead and watch it. I'm sorry I ruined 18 minutes of your life, but the last three are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. All right, all right. <laughs> Same, man. Throw it out there. Get we got all movies, and I'm excited about it. You, uh, all right. All right, let's talk a little Errol Spence. <laughs> I love Errol Spence. I, I know you man. do. I'm trying to make you. I'm trying to make your night tonight. He's the truth. He is the truth. And Mikey Garcia says he wants the truth, and he wants him in December. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Uh, let's laugh him. Let's laugh him. Uh, man, I, I mean, I know why. You know why. We all know why. Can you – okay, so I'll give my opinion, and I'm sure you have a, a very good rebuttal. And the fact of the matter is um, Mikey Garcia is just he's, – he, he's – Mikey Garcia is just he, – he, he, he rules 140 at 135. He cannot rule 147. He can compete and not rule. And Spence will utterly destroy Mikey Garcia. I mean I'm being – I'm over – I'm definitely an over exaggeration, but Spence will beat Mikey Garcia at 147 hands down. Uh, like I mean, I'm not disagreeing with that at all. Like I'm, I'm a hundred. Okay. I, I know, but I think you have, don't you have a theory? I think you I, were telling me earlier about a theory of why he wants to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like when we look at Mikey Garcia and we look at where he's at in his career, for us, for me and you, and I think for a lot of boxing fans out there right now, like we see pretty much. One fight for Mikey Garcia that kind of looks like his career fight, and that's Vasily Lomachenko. You know, Lomachenko was climbing the ladder. He just beat Linares at 135. You're saying Mikey Garcia rules 135, but man, I like I pose a question to you: like, does he? Because Lomachenko is now at one. He's a 135 champion. So is Mikey Garcia. So I don't know. I don't know that. Uh, wait, did they fight at one? Yeah, they fought at 135. The Linares fight was at 135, right? Correct. Lemo has the 135. Belt. So does Garcia, because Garcia came down, or he's fighting Easter at 135. Yeah, uh, Garcia has a belt at 135, and so does Easter. And Lomachenko. Yes. So, I mean, I don't know that Mikey Garcia rules 135, but, you know, we talk about uh, Lomachenko all the time, and we say, you know, he's legacy hunting, he's legacy hunting, he's climbing up the weights, he's doing the Manny Pacquiao thing, you know, and yeah. I think he is, and I think Garcia, after he fought Lippinette, wanted to go back down and I think he just realized that 140 was getting a little big for him and he had yeah. designs on 147 and we thought that division was going to be him, Bud, and Spence and then after the Lepinette fight he was kind of like yeah, I don't know if I want to go to 147 but I think after Lomachenko beat Linares, I think that opened the door for Mikey Garcia to kind of understand that I'm, I, I can't you know, he can't fight Lomachenko and gain much from it you know, if he's looking at 147 and he goes up and fights Errol Spence and he fights a tough fight and loses, it still looks better for Garcia than if he fights a tough fight against Lomachenko at 135 and wins that fight. Be because Lomachenko's a featherweight. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And the fact of the matter is that once, but once Garcia beats Easter, if, if you know, gotta say, if, if Garcia beats Easter Jr., they don't have two belts. And then. It's not a natural course to fight Lomachenko to get the third belt, or no? I, I think for me, you, boxing fans out there, but I think I think Mikey Garcia, and I'll give him a lot of credit. Like I think he's a like a little bit of a legacy hunter too. I think he's starting to compare his legacy to Lomachenko, and he's realizing that fighting Lomachenko only helps Lomachenko's legacy, not his. And, and you know that that's definitely a, a good point. But uh, Mikey Garcia has been, has been on record numerous times saying that he is going to just dominate 140, 135, and 130. And that, that's, that's, that was his plans. He, he said, 
you know, I'm going to go up to 140, win all those belts. I'm going to go down to 135, win all those belts. And then it was like, oh, I, I had a few fights at 140. Now I'm going to go back down to 135 and win all those belts, and then I'll go back up. But now it's like all of a sudden you're at 135, fight Eastern, and you want to turn around and gain 12 pounds and fight Spence five months later or four months later? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, it's crazy. That, 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 that seems a little bit... It's a little bit crazy to me. Now, Mikey Garcia is a, a is a talented man, a very uh, almost a freak of nature wise. Just ha- how his work ethic and and his dedication and how he does things, but it just seems like he's a little bit all over the place. And uh, I I can respect someone more for sticking to what they want to do and, and and saying what they mean and meaning what they do. But it just seems like like you said, like all of a sudden Lomachenko came up and now. Now Garcia has to change his plans again, which I really I don't think he has to, but I'm a boxing fan and, and I guess maybe he thinks he has to. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know that he has to or not. I but I do understand like if that were his mentality where he was starting to compare himself to Lomachenko, I would understand where he's coming from, but I agree with you. I think he's all over the place. I don't think that this is a rational idea. <laughs> like, you know, uh, Mikey, Mikey, you're, you're going to get killed. And I love Mikey Garcia. I think he's one of the most talented boxers in the world. But, yeah. man, you, so is Errol Spence. And Errol Spence is potentially a super welterweight. You know, he's already talking about going up to 156. Yeah. <laughs> don't, Mikey, don't do that. <laughs> he, it's just, it, 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 you really, he needs to pump the brakes. Long yeah, long. like, it. let me ask you. I mean, like, if Mikey fights Lomachenko, and wins a tough fight, like wins a split decision, 12 rounds, or maybe it looks a little bit like Linares Lomachenko where Mikey knocks him out late with a with a liver shot or something like that, but not like a conclusive beating, not like Lomachenko couldn't have won that fight. Okay. What do you think? I mean, th- does that do anything for Mikey Garcia? Um, It does, but it, it, it does now because of Lomo's status, the way Lomo has been, like we say, and you say, legacy hunter. And Lomo was putting them wins under his belt, and with every win that he has, um, it, it makes his pound for pound status just more so, uh, more it holds more weight, more validity to it. And if Garcia beats Eastern and turns around and fights, Lomo will probably fight somebody else between this and between um, the Garcia and Easter fight and so right. forth. So. Um, Lomo is ready. I mean, he'll fight an elite talent at 135, whatever the case may be, and then and he'll fight Garcia if that if that's how the plan shake out. So, um, I personally, if it goes out the way you say, a split decision squeaker, Lomo could have won kind of thing, and I, I I don't think it tarnishes really anything because you beat a man that's considered pound for pound in the world. But I personally don't see that fight going that way. I personally see Garcia decisively beating Lomachenko, in my opinion. I, I think that there's... I think that's probably true, <laughs> but I'm just... I, I, I'm just learning... I This is Tom Brady in 2006 where I'm just starting to learn not to bet against Lomachenko. I like, I, I, I thought Linares was going to be a little too much for him to handle, and Linares gave him a lot. And Lomachenko just keeps on ticking, man, and, you know, I, I don't know, maybe one day we'll see him beat Deontay Wilder and we'll be all like, whoa, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, and the fact is, like that fight, but that fight went how we went, it, we, how we thought it would go. We just, we're always. It's funny thing is, we're always surprised when we fu- when we see a fight go how we think it's going to go. It, it's kind of a funny thing because I think we always expect surprises, and then when we don't get them, it's uh, kind of like, whoa, we were right. Like, what's going on here? And we all said that Lomachenko would win decisively, and that Linares would give him the most trouble that he's ever gotten, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Although I don't know, still just liver shot, man. Like I still, uh, it's, it's you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's just it's just not decisive to me. Like I, it is because it's a knockout, and I get it. And you know, there's a lot of skill into a liver shot, but there's a lot of luck too. And uh, I, I mean, I would love, I would just love to see a rematch. But I'm kind of with you. I don't like rematches. But that was a fun fight to watch. It was, it was. Uh, you know, I you know, I'd rather see Lomo fight uh, Lomo fight um, Garcia as opposed to a rematch with Linares. So speaking of Errol Spence, Errol uh, Spence is saying he's not interested in signing with Bob Arum, Oscar De La Hoya, or Fast Eddie. How do you feel about that? Good for him. I I think it's a great move, and I, I like 
the fact that uh, fighters, the thing is nowadays, it's all about money, 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 money. So when you're with a promoter, which it, it, it feels in, in my opinion, our opinion, I believe we, we agree on this, is that promoters don't promote their fighters <laughs> well enough. Like uh, we, 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 we both agree. We talked about this. that Eddie Hearn is probably one of the best promoters now as far as promoting his fighters. And it's like Mayweather doesn't promote a fighter like he promotes his strip clubs more so than his fighters. And De La Hoya just has – uh, Saul and that's his cash cow and that's all he worries about and and, and Aram just you know he seems to just he, he's clinging on the ESPN and, and doing whatever they're he's allowing them to do whatever they want to do and it just seems like you know Aram's older and he's been doing it for a long time and, and he's very good at his job but he's just not good enough in in today's standard because of the state that boxing is in so when you can be maybe a fighter like Floyd Mayweather like Triple G that promote yourselves and, you know, more money stays in house and you get to promote yourself as far as saying that uh, as much as I want to put myself out there is as much as I'm going to do it. So you have no one else to blame but yourself when you don't make the money or when um, you aren't getting the numbers that you're supposed to get. Yeah. And, you know, I really like the idea of I like what Errol Spence is thinking here, too. So he went off and he started his own promotion company, Man Down Promotions. And, you know, this kind of works twofold for him. From one standpoint, you know, he wants to promote Dallas Fighters, and I really appreciate that because Texas has just become such a hotbed for boxing, and, and he wants to kind of take, you know, his success and cultivate that boxing culture in his hometown. And it started with his relationship with the Charlos, because, I mean, they're from Houston. I, you know, I know Houston and Dallas are two separate cities, but it's the same region, it's the same area. They're promoting Texas out there. So, I mean, I love that from that standpoint. I love that Errol Spence is kind of looking at life outside of the ring um, and kind of getting himself set up. Because, I mean, he's got five years as a great fighter left. But, I mean, that's it. That five years is not a long time. Exactly. And just the culture in boxing, like you said, it's it cha- it's ever uh, changing, I guess, to use the word evolving. It, it always evolves because now it's like it seems like our, our southern states and our western, like, California, Arizona um, – uh, Texas, Texas is such like you said to use the word hotbed. It's such a hotbed for 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 fighters right now, and it seems like um, statement made earlier that that shift is making from Las Vegas to New York as far as the balance of, of these big fights and and just to, to be able to take advantage of this to grab a hold of it, it's really going to be it's really better for the sport of boxing because if, if a promoter is not going to promote you and if you're going to promote yourself and you'll do it better than anybody else will. So I yeah like and. and- You know, what can a promoter do for Errol Spence at this point? Like, he's built a name. Like, he is becoming America's most popular boxer, if he's not already. And he did that all representing himself with Al Heyman's advisorship. And what what does he need Bob Arum, Roscoe De La Hoya, or Eddie Hearn for at this point? He needs to work well with them so he can fight their fighters, but that's it. Exactly. And um, when when you are... And the fact is, when you are one of the the most popular boxers in America, then Aram, De La Hoya, and Hearn are going to want a good relationship with you because you're going to draw the numbers. So that's going to mean more money for them and their fighters when they set up a fight with you if anybody has a good welterweight. And obviously, top rank has T-Bud. Yep. And... Aram, you know, he's going to play as nicey nice as he can with Earl Spence to get that joint pay per view thing going when that fight does happen. Yep, yep, yep. I, man, I, Errol, Errol Spence is just like he's just an impressive guy all around. He, he really is. It's like it's uh, he, he built it like you said. He built the name for himself. He did it all himself with a- advisors and not like he was the leader. Yep. Like, how do you deny Earl Spence? Can't do it. I don't. I love them. So, the IBF, I believe, uh-huh. moving off of Errol Spence. We okay. talk about Errol Spence enough. We talk about Errol Spence all the time. We do. We do. We Absolutely. love Absolutely. But moving off that, the IBF, I believe, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, has ordered Adonis Superman Stevenson to fight Alexander Gvazdik. Oh, I like this. Yeah. I, what do you think? What do you think? What you got? Who you got? Well, I mean, if you if you are correct in saying the IBF, I mean, the IBF has also 
uh, did this to Triple G, stripping him of his belt and and making uh, try, trying to to get some movement going in the middleweight division, even though it got clogged again. But the fact is, I'm loving the IBF right now. If this is what they did, Adonis Stevenson fights once That's a year. WBC. I'm sorry, I ruined your day. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> anyway. So, but the WBC is, I mean, but they are the authority of boxing. Yep. They're taking they're taking a page out of the IBF book, so I appreciate that. So it's the same same yep. statement, just so we're taking a page, okay? So, and, and I love this because the fact of the matter is, um, Adonis Stevenson fights once a year. He's forty years old. We saw some things in his last fight against Badu Jack, and th- this uh, Gavalsdick, this 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 young and up and comer, is ready to get it, and, and I'm loving this. So either Don Stevenson is going to retire or he's going to fight and take this loss. Yeah, I don't I don't think I agree with you on that, man. We wa- and, that's, and, and that's fine. Go ahead. We, go. we watched, me and you, I think, together watched this fight, uh, uh, Mehdi Amir versus Gavazdik. Yes, we had. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you what, I just was not impressed with what I saw from Gavazdik that night. I, like, he came in and he looked like... This kind of looked like a tune-up fight or, like, maybe like a, a gatekeeper, a stepping stone kind of fight. It probably wasn't, like, that differential in, in talent and skill. But Gavazdik was clearly the guy that was supposed to win this fight going away. And uh, Amar gave him more trouble than I really expected to see out of that fight. Okay, well, maybe Gavazdik took the, took the fight lightly and maybe, you know, he, he came in hard... And Gavalsnik was like, oh, oh. Uh, but Gavalsnik eventually got a whole handle on the fight and, and, and won it convincingly. Uh, I get what you're saying, but come on. Yeah. You know Gavalsnik's nickname is The Nail, right? I love that name. And you know what Adonis Stevenson does to nails? He gets one hammered into him. He Christina hammers them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's see what you did there. You like that segue? <laughs> Look, hammer... Surprise me and surprise you. Big Friday time. Night, correct. Big time. Friday night was a great night. We had the ladies fighting. We had Christina Hammer and Clarissa Shields co-maining on Showtime. Uh, and that looks to be the the women's side super fight that, that everybody's building up for the next few, I don't know, next few months because the women fight so much more frequently and they don't tend to hold out like Triple G and Canelo do. Yeah. So that fight looks like it's going to get made at some point, and we were really excited about that until Friday night. Um, yeah, and take it away, man. You're right. <laughs> Christina Hammer was surprising. Christina Hammer literally boxed Tori Nelson's face off, like from bell to bell, round to round, ten rounds. I, I felt I loved Tori Nelson. She's she she is a tough, strong. She's been in this game a long time back before women's boxing wasn't popular and she was one of these ones leading the way for women in boxing and she always came in and always put on a good show was always ready and it, it broke my heart twofold broke my heart because Tori Nelson I do like her um, but Christina Hammer literally uh, dismantled her for 10 rounds and uh, the second fold of my heart being broke is that Christina Hammer looked a little too good uh, for, for, for my liking um, yeah, Christina Hammer looked a little too good for my liking because we want that super fight between Hammer and Shields, and we don't think that Shields is ready for it. Yeah, you were texting me. You were like, Shields is not ready for this girl, and I was like, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I the, the surprising thing was, like, I, it's not surprising. Like, a lot of things weren't really surprising. It wasn't surprising that Hammer won the fight going away yeah. the way she did, and it wasn't yeah. really surprising that Tori Nelson hung in there because Tori Nelson is a very tough fighter. Absolutely. Like that, she, I mean, her chin must be just be granite or something because she has stood up to some monster punchers uh, in her yes. career. Yes. But Christina Hammer likes to kind of fight like, you know, kind of stand at a distance, kind of just score points and win fights that way and keep her face pretty. Yeah. And, you know, Tori Nelson, before the fight started, said, no, 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 I'm going to come after her and I'm going to make her fight. And well, she accomplished that goal, but... <laughs> Christina Hammer can fight like that too, apparently. <laughs> and it looked like Hammer took it a little personal because yes. she has a muster on those punches. She did, and and I think um, I think Christina Hammer was just one hundred percent super focused and ready for the whole night in general. I think that 
Christina Hammer felt a little slighted being the co-main event. Again, it was her first time fighting in America, but you know, Clarissa Shields, even though they're fighting in her home state, Clarissa Shields is 5-0, and and Christina Hammer is 22-0, I believe, 22-0-1 or something, something like that. Something like that. She's definitely the veteran of the two. Yes, so I'm sure she feels a little slighted as being the co-main under the main as opposed – she is the champion defending her belt to where she had Clarissa Shields and Hannah Gabriels are fighting for vacant belts that I'm sure Christina Hammer believes that she is owed to. So she took a personal, what Tori Nelson said. She took the whole night personal. She came in. She literally beat Tori Nelson's face for 10 rounds. And then after Clarissa Shields' fight, she straight up hopped into that ring like and charged Clarissa Shields because Clarissa Shields called her out. She's like, where's she at? I'll beat her butt right now. And Christina Hammer was in her face before she finished the last syllable on that sentence. And – uh, I th- Christina Hammer had something to prove Friday night, and I think she proved it. Yeah, I, I don't think I can disagree with any of that. <laughs> it was nuts. I, I felt so bad. Like, Tori Nelson's in the corner, and it, you know, it's the 10th round, uh, and it's women's, yeah. women's championships only go 10 rounds or 10 two minutes. Yep. Yep. And her corner is telling her that she can still win this fight, and Tori rolled her eyes at him, and he was like, don't give me that look. I, people get knocked down in the 10th round. Tori's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, I, 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 yeah, it was a shame. Just such a defeated fighter, and it's not again. It's not Tori. I mean, it's Christina Hammer is just an absolute monster. But that leads us into the second surprise we got, which we got nice and early. Yeah, yeah, we got Clarissa Shields versus Hannah Gabriel's. Oh, yeah. Hannah Gabriel's was the champion at the time, two belts. Um, I they were, kinda, vac- they were vacant. They were oh, sorry, they were vacant. Hannah Gabriels came up in weight, and then Krista Shields came down in weight. They both had belts in their weight classes. You're right, you're right, you're so, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of thought Clarissa Shields would just walk through her, and this would just be a duplicate of – because Shields fought Tori Nelson a couple yes. a couple months ago. I thought this would just be a repeat of what we saw there. And first round, uh, Shields walks into an uppercut from Gabriels, and Gabriels put her on her butt. Thanks. Oh man! Yeah, it was it was a bad moment if you're a Clarissa Shields fan. I, I was so like I, I I mean I remember being you texting like oh my goodness like my heart was in my throat and and uh, I couldn't believe what was happening I I got so scared from that knockdown even though I realized like when I saw her hit the ground and I saw her face she was most certainly not even hurt so it was definitely a flash knockdown like, the look on her face was surprised like oh my goodness I can't believe I let this woman put me down now i have to get up and do some work and come from behind yeah yeah but i mean i'll tell you what i mean i clarissa was probably about as surprised with what she saw from hannah as i was i mean gabriel's really gave shields a lot to deal with early in that fight not just the knockdown and and i know shields ends up winning the fight nine to one plus the knockdown so you know it ends up uh like a 98 91 scorecard but the, the fight wasn't as wide as the scorecards made it seem. Hannah Gabriel's lost a few of those rounds early, very close. Um, I, th- I think the scorecards are right. I think she did lose those rounds. Uh, but they weren't... She wasn't being dominated early. She was really putting up the fight. Shields really took some time to ramp into settling in and composing herself and imposing her will on Hannah Gabriel's. Exactly, and and I can't argue with the fact that too. I I, I kind of feel like Clarissa Shields lost the first round, got knocked down, and then got up and proceeded to to lay a whooping on Hannah Gabriel's for the next nine rounds. And I know that yeah, I, I gotta agree with you that the 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 the, the earlier round two, three, and four were probably closer, but five on uh, was literally all Shields, and and the scorecards reflected that. I kind of liken it to it like a arm wrestling match, like the the. the the one, the, the stronger guy that looks like he's going to lose is he goes out early on the the big strong champion and uh, pushes their their hand all the way down and the hand literally almost touches the the, the mat to to lose but then the other champion like champion actually starts to slowly lift the hand lift the hand lift the hand and then all of a sudden it's like boom lights out he 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 wins he wins by cranking it all the way over so and I guess that's that's kind of what it equates to as far as the way she wins rounds two, three, and four, slightly marginally, but then five through ten, 
she whooped up on Hannah Gabriels. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's kudos and to, to Clarissa Shields, T-Rex, getting up off that canvas and, and fighting for, for what she needed. Yeah, I mean, as much as we feel like she's not ready for Christina Hammer, um, this felt like a big step up for her in, you know... <sighs> You know, we had Ron L on a couple of weeks ago, and he told us, you know, you learn so much from your first loss, you learn so much from the hardships. And then she had to go through those hardships against Anna Gabriels for the first time in her career, and she probably yeah. took more from that fight than maybe she was expecting to. Yeah, I'm glad she did. Like, you know, it's a great point, like, that you learn from your losses and your hardships, and that was hard for her to come back. And she did, and she did it gracefully, and she did, and she did it in good style. And But she took that knockdown like a champ. And she learned a lot against Hannah Gabriels that night. And I don't know if that if she gained that experience against Hannah Gabriels, the experience that she needs for Hammer. But I still think she needs three or four, maybe to five more fights under her belt before she takes on Hammer. And I don't know if she's going to do that. I think you're right. I, th- I don't know about – I think four or five might be a little much, but I definitely think she, she probably needs a couple more fights before she's ready for Hammer. Yeah, and um, like we talked about this before, Shields. If Shields fought Hammer right now, next fight, yeah, it would be competitive, and Shields could win. I don't know if she will. So I, I like to, I like to get to a point to where I'm 100% confident in Clarissa Shields. I, I firmly believe she is her her attitude, her actions, what she does in her community, uh, how she handles herself on social media, news conferences, workouts. She. She is literally going to be and is the face of women's boxing. She will be. She will uh, spearhead women's boxing like just like uh, Layla Ali did. And I, I believe that she will be one of those top women in the world, pound for pound number one. And I, I just want her to get there the right way. I don't want her to, to, to have it tarnished by a loss to Christina Hammer. Speaking of uh, Ron L. Okay. Got a little announcement on that? Oh, Ron L. Punisher Burnett is fighting for the Missouri State Championship June 29th. So go to Instagram, Ron L. Punisher Burnett, and, or it's just Ron L. Burnett 85 on Instagram, and follow him, support him, send him some love, encouragement, and on Facebook, Ron L. Burnett on Facebook. You'll find him and just, just follow him and just show, throw him out some likes and, and just let him know you're behind him and you're rooting for him and he, he's a, yeah, you, if you guys heard the interview, I'm sure you hear, you heard how he is, like the way he works, his mindset, his work ethic. He's just he's a great guy, and we need to get behind him. Absolutely, he is going for the Missouri State Championship. Yeah, yeah. And spoiler alert, he is going to win. <laughs> but support him anyway. Definitely support him. <laughs> you want to get on? You want to get on that boat early because Ron L is a good fighter. Um, you gonna be seeing him on TV one day. You want to be like, yo, I remember when I used to listen to this guy when he was 2-0. and Yep. You do. I mean, you, you want to get on that boat early because he'll get you some tickets ringside, all that stuff. Oh, man, don't tell people that. Oh, uh, I didn't mean that. I, I meant us. He'll get us ringside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Kind of a quiet weekend, man. I got to watch uh, Miguel Burchell versus uh, Jonathan Barrows this weekend. It was just wanted to throw it out and mention, you know, it was a title fight. It was a WBC super featherweight title fight. Okay. Uh, it was quick. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Burchell is a, in my opinion, Burchell is a big super featherweight, and Jonathan okay. Barros is a true featherweight. I mean, he is probably right seated where he's at in that division, and Barros is getting a little bit older at this point. Burchell's kind of still, like, in his prime. Um, and, and the fight just reflected all these factors. Burchell knocks him out in the second round. Um, kudos to, to Barros' corner. Uh, they jumped into the ring and stopped the fight. Uh, Barros was not happy about it, uh, but, which, you know, I, I feel like everybody responded the way they should. You know, Barros should want to continue fighting, but yeah. the corner's job is to protect their man, and, and they did. You know, this this fight wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah, it was kind of like uh, uh, Jamie Mung- Jaime Munguia versus... Uh... Um, Saddam Ali. Oh, man. Kind of how it looked like, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it didn't look quite as brutal as that, but that's, I mean, that's a pretty good analog for what we saw. Oh, man. Poor Saddam Ali. I and mean, he, he just kept getting back up off the mat. Yeah, and speaking of that, uh, Jaime Mungi agreed to fight Liam Beefy Smith. Poor Liam Smith. 
<laughs> That's exactly what my response was when somebody told me. <laughs> oh, man. I said, poor Beefy. <laughs> uh, that's going to be rough. <laughs> and that, that sums that fight up. If anybody wants to know anything else about that, go look it up because we just told you pretty much everything about it. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe Mungia is just not as good as we think he is. Maybe, maybe that's maybe you know maybe, maybe we can hold on to that for a little bit. And okay, I, I still I still don't see Liam Smith beating him. Um, <laughs> but maybe he's you know I, maybe maybe he gets exposed in the Smith fight and he's flashing the pan. Maybe I, I I mean you know even though like. But, but seriously, we, we talked about – we saw that Saddam Ali fight with Jaime Munguia, and Saddam Ali is a, is a good boxer, and, and he, he had to be saved from himself. And you saw the adjustments that Jaime Munguia was making in his boxing skills. It's just – it was a shame that every shot that Munguia landed was like a bomb on Saddam Ali's face. But you saw the boxing skills, so that's why I don't think that he's a flash in the pan, and I don't think that Liam Beefy Smith is going to even come close. He'll last a little longer than Saddam Ali, but I think we're going to look see a similar result. I don't think I can disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you like you always like hold out that hope that you can find some reason to to be excited about a fight, and I am just not. I mean, I'm excited because I want to see more Munguia, but that's about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited because I want to see that, and then I also I want to, you know, a Charlo Munguia matchup or, or a Swift yeah, Jarrett. That's Herb. what I want to see. Yeah. I mean, come on. So if he if he if he shows up again against Liam Beefy Smith, now technically, like Salam Ali and Liam Beefy Smith are two good fighters, borderline good greatness ish area. Top contenders, like like a David Lemieux or a Martin Murray in the middleweight division kind of thing. Sure. And, you know, Jaime Mugia dismantles both of them. That puts them right up top there. You know, Swift Jared Hurd, Laura, uh, Charlo, like, let's go. Make some fights. Come on. <laughs> but. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I. Oh, man. We got nothing again next week either, do we? I mean, like, look, I mean, I'm enjoying having a little bit of a break. Like, I, I don't think, you know, listeners realize, but, like, sometimes we watch a fight, like, two or three times between Saturday night and Sunday morning when we record. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, we, we got to get something going on here. How long until that uh, in, until that Pacquiao fight? You know I'm excited for that. <laughs> well, it's July 14th, and, and early reports, well, not early reports, but reports are circling around that, the fight might not happen because of monetary issues. Oh, God, no. Don't let that happen. <laughs> Why would well, you do this to me tonight? <laughs> we don't have to talk about Oh, that. man. we got to talk about it's, it a little bit. It, it's speculation and the payment the, the payment from, from Pacquiao, because Pacquiao has his own promotional company now because he's no longer with Top Rank, and the payment from Pacquiao to Matisse's camp is a month late. Um, the payment, Aram is still top rank is still promoting like broadcasting the fight like it's not promoting it but it's actually responsible for the telecast of the fight and their payment is supposedly um a month overdue so we have uh two sides of monetary payments that are a month overdue but um pacquiao pacquiao and his camp are claiming that all monies are correct at this point so we have no idea who to believe at this point. You know what's weird is uh, after the Jeff Horn fight last year, Freddie Roach claimed he wasn't paid some three months after that fight. Uh, I, I, I don't know yeah, how that got, if that ever got settled or whatever happened, but they, they parted ways, and then Freddie said he wasn't paid yet. Uh, it was weird. Yeah, that is weird. I mean, Pacquiao received $10 million to fight Horn. Wow, man. 10.6 10. mil. I hope Manny's okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, is he dumping into his country? I have no idea what's going on. Well, I'll tell you what's going on next weekend. We got two events I just wanna I just wanna run through real quick. Uh, one one's a little fun, but the problem is unless you're in Connecticut, it doesn't really matter. But at the Mohegan uh, Sun Casino, uh, up in Connecticut, uh, Joe Smith Jr. is fighting, which I didn't know Joe Smith Jr. still fought. And for our younger listeners who might not know who Joe Smith Jr. is. Uh, he basically ended Bernard Hopkins' career. Oh. Um, now, I mean, well, Father Time ended Bernard Hopkins' career, but Joe Smith Jr. put yeah. him on the coffin. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't be disrespecting Beehive. Fair enough. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> he never let a white boy beat him. No, no, he never did. Uh, except for Kazagi. <laughs> hey, Kazagi ain't white. What? There's miscegenation in his heritage. We're, we're done here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! But on that card, too, is my girl Callie Reese. Okay. And we saw Kyler Reese fight Cecile Breakhouse a couple months or weeks ago. Man, time blends at this point. Uh, but we, her last fight was against Cecile Breakhouse, uh, who's another class in, in women's boxing right now. And Kyler Reese gave her a fight. Like, for real. Like, we, we were, like, knocked uh, Breakhouse down for the first time in her career and looked like she was going to, you know, finish her. And we were, like, on the edge of our seat yelling and screaming about that fight. Yeah. And, and Callie Reese's record does not reflect somebody that would uh, y- you would think is going to beat a Cecile Breakhouse. But, man, we, we were rooting for her. We were. We were. And we'll be rooting for her again on Saturday at the Mohegan Sun Casino. Absolutely, and you're, you might have a little bit of a hangover because Friday night, June 29th, you're going to be in the house, ain't you? Absolutely, I am excited. Man, you should be. Uh, uh, Bam promotion, uh, Bam Boxing and Johan Promotions uh, uh, has Nick uh, ringside in the press area. We're going to give you full uh, – Nick will give you full lowdown, breakdown on all the fights, and he'll be there. We'll have a photographer there, and we'll have a bunch of good pictures and a bunch of good reporting, and it's going to be an action-packed night. Ben Salem, PA, Parks Casino, seven fantastic fights, welterweights, super super lightweights, super bantamweights, all that. Just fist of flying, and it's going to be nuts. I am stoked. <laughs> I can't I'm tell so you how excited jealous. I am. I'm so jealous. I'm going to be in Florida. Uh, I mean, I think I still win this one. I'm going to hang with Keith Thurman. I'm going to send you selfies. I mean, I head on, you're going to be in Tampa, so head on over to Clearwater, man. See if he's around. Do, do it. I'm just going to go around. I'm going to go find a park and see if there's any flutes, hear some flutes playing. Dude, I really believe that dude's on a yacht sailing around the world right now with his wife and his kid. Like, I just think, like, what could he be doing right now? Uh, you know, whatever he wants. He, he's Keith Thurman. <sighs> Lucky. Hey. hey, he got out with his health and his money. I, I, I'm not going to begrudge the man. I'll begrudge the fighter, but not the man. Hey, yeah, you know, more power to him. But the fighter, Keith, no time, Thurman. But Parks, you know, Ben Salem. If you see me there, say hi. If you want to argue a little bit, I'll argue a little bit with you. If you want to tell me you like Triple G, yeah, we'll argue a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, I'm all for it. But at least tell Nick you like the show, and you love the show, and you want to be a part of the show, and you want to help us, and you want to talk to us about it, and go ahead and do that. And tell me who your favorite co-host is. It's Joe. And I'll report back to Joe that everybody said me. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to say absolutely the King Biscuit Joe. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not going to say that? Uh, no, probably not to my face. I, I, I won't blame them. They, they should say you because you're the level-headed one, the intelligent one. No, boxing fans don't like level-headed. <laughs> they're going to tell you. They're going to say you need to get rid of that Joe character and get yourself another guy in there. Is what they're going to say. That way. I, I, I need your personality, man. I'm just, you know... <laughs> He's a smart guy. That's all I do. Yeah, yeah. You have zero personality. Damn. Nothing comes to cry. Yeah, nothing. There you go. Okay. We got. No, I was being. I was being sarcastic. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I'm alright with that. I right, go. Cool. <laughs> I mean, uh, top rank Saturday night. It's got a fight going on too. Title fight. So I figured I'd bring it up because we're a boxing podcast. We got to pretend like we care, but. We're... <laughs> But really, this fight, I don't know. Like this fight, I, so Romer, uh, Romer Angulo, I don't know much about him. Um, I haven't watched him fight. Uh, Gilberto Ramirez, know a little bit about him. Seen him fight a few times. This is WBO super middleweight title. Again, super middleweight to me. It's a little thin on talents. Um, Ramirez is certainly a good fighter. Uh, there's there's no reason to kind of you know put him down, but. Um, W- well, this makes this makes the the BJS moving up to 168 uh, rumors uh, a little more clear now because I mean take the belt from Chunky, take the belt from Ramirez, take the belt from Benavides, and you know you're you're undisputed super middleweight champion of the world. You know it's not really as crazy as it sounds. No, it's really not. I mean, you know that's why we're all sitting here scratching it. because they, when, when you know I know we talked about this earlier, but nobody talked about what weight class they're him and Chunky are fighting that and what belt they're fighting for. So that's why this is like, this fight makes no sense. You know, if he fights at super middle for Chunky's belt, I think it makes a little more sense. But if Chunky comes down the middleweight, 
I and his age, man. Like, can he can he even shed that kind of weight to fight at middleweight? And what kind of condition is he going to be in? Like we we talked about earlier, we saw him against Caleb Truax, and he looked old in that fight. He won that fight, but man, yeah. he did not look he did not look like a spry fighter at all. And I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't see him dropping eight pounds, getting down the middleweight, and then beating Billy Joe Saunders, who is just going to get on his bicycle and ride around all night. Yeah, there's 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 no way. I, even if even at 168, I don't think he's got a chance. No. Well, again, this doesn't have the style that's going to beat BJS. Like, he just doesn't have it. So, fact is, um, R- Ramirez and and Gula title fight, top rank, probably going to be on ESPN Plus Saturday night. Watch it. Yeah, uh, BoxRex telling me ESPN USA and ESPN three. Uh, so okay. my guess is, yeah, that's gonna. If you have ESPN three, check that. If you don't, check ESPN plus. You'll probably be there, is my guess. Yeah, and again, just to let you guys know, again, come on out, Ben Salem, Friday night, June twenty third. Go see Nick, and more importantly, just go see the the fights and and Bam Boxing and Johan Promotions, and just a good night of boxing. And like we got a rematch. We got we got Philly on Philly. Fighters, we got Philly versus Jersey fighters. Like the main event is, is um, Miguel Cartagena. He's Philly zone. He's fighting uh, Ma- Magdalena from LA. It's like Philly. It's like PA versus LA, California. It's going to be nuts. It's, it's awesome. Damn right. The main event is is an old fashioned Puerto Rican versus Mexican fight. Oh yeah, a flyweight, right? <laughs> yes, oh, a Puerto Rican, yeah. a Puerto Rican Mexican slugfest at flyweight. Come on. How do y'all feel about 2,000 punches? It's going to happen. Oh, it's only an eight-round fight, though, so maybe not 2,000. Maybe 1,500. 1,500, and somebody's going to get knocked out. I'll tell you what, Cartagena got some power. He got some pop mm-hmm. for a little guy. I'm telling you. Philly, so. I'll be, <laughs> be ringside for that knockout. Also, uh, this week, check out, well, we're going to get uh, in contact with some of the uh, staff and, and maybe fighters or, or BAM herself or somebody – this week we will have a midweek, possibly have a midweek episode um, showcasing the fights for Friday night, and uh, we'll get somebody on and we'll, we'll we'll bring it to you. We'll break down all the fights. Absolutely, so catch us in the middle of the week. I guess that yeah. technically will be our last on the road yeah, podcast well, episode. <laughs> you're right. You are correct. Sorry about that. So disclaimer: this is not the last episode. The next one is <laughs> the last regular episode next Sunday when you guys come visit us. We're going to talk about Box Casino fights. Um, God, man, what are we going to talk about next week? We're gonna we're gonna catch you up on what's going on with Pacquiao and Matisse, though. We're gonna make sure that fight's happening. Yeah, I'm sure all this other stuff will shake out. We'll probably have uh, maybe some more Wilder Joshua news, maybe some more Triple G Canelo news, and maybe solidified as BJS chunky nonsense, and just you know some more fights that are being made and stuff that's about to happen because July is lit. I mean, we got. We got we got Garcia Easter and a bunch of other fights and, and Matisse Pacquiao. I mean, July's lit coming up. Yeah, I mean, on July seventh we got Jose Ramirez versus Danny O'Connor. I don't know a lot about Danny O'Connor, but Jose Ramirez super lightweight belt should be a fun night. Yeah. Should be. So, remember we last night on the ropes podcast we'll be absolutely boxing, but for now everything's still at on the ropes cast. On Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, if you want to drop us a line, hit us up on Gmail real quick. Uh, we're at on the oh, I'm sorry, we're on the ropes pod at gmail.com. Uh, and you can check out our website. Sign up for the newsletter. Hit that like and subscribe button on iHeartRadio, Podbean, YouTube. We got up on YouTube now. We're gonna start. Uh, we want to start a little video series for you on the history of some of the biggest fights that we can think of. So just give you an example. Uh, premiere episode. We're looking at. Buster Douglas versus Mike Tyson and if you are an older guy if you're in your 50s or 60s you remember this fight really well maybe you catch up with a little refresher but if you're younger guys if you're in your 20s your 30s maybe you know about the Buster Douglas Mike Tyson fight of course you know that was the biggest upset in history and it happened in Japan but do you know why it became an upset do you know what all the fanfare around that fight was do you know what the fallout was for Buster Douglas winning that fight Joe do you know what the Crazy. do you know what the fallout was the fallout for Buster Douglas beating Mike Tyson? Yes. 
I mean, besides breaking everybody's heart and just making us all feel like we're the worst human beings in the world, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's just just for a little sample. <laughs> we almost had the 1991 version of Mike Tyson versus Evander Holyfield. We did. And we lost that because of Buster Douglas. We did. Or did we lose it because of Mike Tyson? Mike Tyson. I guess you have to tune in and find out. So that'll be up you on our will. YouTube channel. <laughs> And you can visit our website, sign up for the newsletter, absolutelyboxingcast.com. Do it. All right. Joe, you got anything else? Shout out to Turtle Beats. Turtle Beats. Uh, he's made our intro and our outro. And then when we move over to Absolutely Boxing, he's made us a new beat. And we are pumped to premiere it to you. So shout out Turtle Beats. He working in the lab. He getting it. Shiny and it's fancy. Ooh, bam. Have a good yeah. week, everybody. Catch us next Sunday. Bye!